Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. After the passage of the $1.9 trillion American Recovery Act and the introduction of a massive infrastructure proposal, there's been a good deal of comparisons made between the early days of the Biden presidency and the Franklin Delano Roosevelt New Deal era of the Great Depression. Well, today we're going to be joined by one of the leading scholars on the New Deal to talk about such comparisons and to talk about how much the New Deal transformed government's role in society and how it still affects us today. Joining me over Zoom is Eric Rauschway. Eric Rauschway is a distinguished professor of history at the University of California, Davis. And he's the author of a number of books. His latest is called Why the New Deal Matters. Eric Rauschway, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Thank you for having me. It's good to have you. You know, on this radio program, we've been talking about the New Deal going all the way back to the Great Recession of of 2008. And for the vast majority of that time, sort of felt like, there there is a few others, but not many. We were kind of the only ones really ever talking about it. Um, And now I could do a New Deal search, a new search, and all kinds of articles are showing up. Many of them either saying that, you know, comparing or saying this isn't a good comparison uh, with the, the new Biden administration. What, what are your thoughts today about how we talk about the New Deal era from the Great Depression? Well, I think you're certainly right that it has suddenly come back into vogue and um, that it, it, it does feel like it should have been coming, as you say, since at least 2008 or, or so. And uh that all of a sudden, since January anyway, it really has been at the top of people's agendas. And I think we owe that to the Biden administration's evident uh, willingness to channel both the spirit and some of the policies that relate to the New Deal. Now, as as you say, there are reasons to say, oh, it's nothing like this. This is something that professional historians always say, that the thing that I study is unique. It is from a specific moment in time. And of course, these circumstances are nothing like those. And one could gesture at the things that are different. I think, of course, that rules out any historical comparisons, and I would prefer to have some be allowed. So on that basis, I could point out some obvious reasons this moment compares to that one. If you think about the 1932 election, Herbert Hoover, the incumbent, almost certainly lost re-election because of his failure to provide leadership in a crisis, crisis of global dimensions. And that almost certainly is the reason that Donald Trump you know, lost re-election this last fall so that Roosevelt came in to address a specific immediate crisis. Biden came in to address a specific immediate crisis. Both of them, I think, gained some credibility with the press and with their constituents by competent, immediate redress of a crisis. In the Roosevelt's case, it was the bank panic that had almost caused the complete collapse of the American financial system by the time he took office. In Biden's case, of course, it's the pandemic. That gives both of them a little bit of room to then move forward with other parts of their agenda. And in both cases, that has been big public works programs, as you said at the top of our discussion. And uh, and in both cases, they're justified not only as a way of giving people jobs, but also, and I think this is critical in talking about any comparison with the New Deal, as a way of restoring Americans' faith that the government at Washington, D.C., can actually work for us rather than merely for the very rich or the very powerful. This pandemic is probably the biggest sort of thing I, I have lived through. I, I, you know, I was not here for the Great Depression. Uh, neither were you. Uh, was not here for World War II, even the Vietnam War. Um, how? But at the, at the same time, I've heard many people say, regardless of how big this moment we're living through right now is, it actually fails to compare to the enormousness of what was going on during the Great Depression? Well, they're tremendously different. I mean, I don't know what, uh, I I think it's more of a question of quality rather than quantity. But look, the, the Depression was essentially four years of deflation and economic contraction Um, Unemployment had reached something close to 25% by the time Roosevelt took office, Um, and that understates the problem that uh, more than half of the people who did have jobs were underemployed because of the, uh, just what, there just wasn't enough work to go around. Prices for agricultural commodities had plummeted so that farmers could no longer drive a 
profit from bringing their crops to harvest. And that's even at a time when people are just starving. So you have food rotting in the fields, people starving in cities, nobody has a job. And this is not just a US problem, it's a global problem that afflicts nations around the world, particularly developed nations. And it leads to a rise of right-wing movements throughout the world. The period after Roosevelt's election and before Roosevelt's first inaugurus is when Hitler comes to power, right? And so you have this deflation, you have rising unemployment, you have rising fascism throughout the world, including the threat of it in the United States. And that is indeed a crisis of world historical dimensions that probably dwarfs what we're living through. At the same time, it's also worth pointing out that the fact of that acute crisis in the late 20s, early 30s, woke a lot of Americans to the realization that the system they had was fundamentally broken and that it ill-served large numbers of Americans, even when it was functioning well. The fact that it was functioning poorly revealed its flaws. And I think that is an important analogy to the current situation we're in, that a lot of people looking at what the pandemic has shown us about our country, about our social safety net, about our priorities politically, about our infrastructure, about any number of things, that we don't want to go back to the way things were. We want to go forward to something better. How important is it to understand the rise of fascism in understanding what was happening here domestically with the FDR administration? Well, Roosevelt, personally, and many other New Dealers were persuaded that Democracy in the U.S. had reached a crisis state similar to that in Germany at the time that many Americans had come to believe that the government simply couldn't function effectively in a democratic society and that they were looking for other alternatives. And right wing movements were on the rise. I know there's currently a debate over whether we call this fascist or not, but it was certainly close enough as far as they were concerned in the 1930s, and it might as well be close enough as far as we're concerned now. There were many Americans who believed that simply the rule of law, which enforced foreclosures and had no relief for ordinary Americans, was therefore a tool of the powerful and could be discarded. There were many Americans who had become persuaded that the Congress was a tool for bankers and had no interest in serving ordinary Americans and likewise the presidency. So you could understand why when Roosevelt was elected, he had a conversation with a friend of his who said, if you succeed, you will be remembered as the greatest of American presidents. And if you fail, you will be remembered as one of the worst. And Roosevelt is supposed to have replied, if I fail, I will be the last, right? That there was a sense that this was a crisis moment for democracy and that the New Deal had to come in and restore Americans' belief that democracy still worked, even if in a flawed and partial way. I, I, I think about Benito Mussolini, considered the founder of, of fascism. And I, I don't know if it's true or not, if he actually got the trains running on time, but that's what they say about Mussolini, right? Uh, the, the trains ran on time. But, but I, I suspect what it pointed to is putting, you know, how one would feel about fascism to the side, there, there was an element of, of getting things working. He, he, things started to work in 1930, in the 1930s again in Italy. Well, that was what the pro Mussolini press said. Yes, that's correct. I think there's some debate as to whether that's actually true. But that's the desire. That's the desire that led to the rise of Mussolini, of other right-wing movements in Europe, and most notably of Nazism. The sense that proper procedure stood in the way of actually doing things. And that a strong man in the language of the day was the right solution, somebody who would come in and act without regard for the niceties of law or parliaments. Did FDR have, did, did he act in a way that predecessors before wouldn't just as a leader? Roosevelt saw himself as acting in the tradition of wartime leaders, right? He thought of himself as facing a crisis that was tantamount to a war, and he used that language. So he wanted the kinds of powers that Woodrow Wilson had had in 1918, or perhaps that Abraham Lincoln had had in the 1860s, power to, you know, have a lot of Congress's ordinary authority delegated to the White House, so especially in the early days of the New Deal. That was how things worked. Uh, as you probably know, the Supreme Court later said you could do that sort of thing, and that shaped uh, how the New Deal was uh, was was reformed going forward. Um, 
it's worth pointing out though, that Roosevelt was insistent that he not move in the direction of a dictatorship, even when people like Walter Lippmann, you know, the, the newspaper columnist, suggested that that was really what the nation needed. Roosevelt was adamant that you didn't want to go down that road. Yeah. What happened in Roosevelt's first midterm election? And I ask this now because everyone's thinking about next year's midterm election and, and the importance of the midterm election and this notion that midterm elections are never good for the party that is in power. Um, what happened in 1934 in, in that midterm election? Did the Democrats lose seats or did they pick up seats? The Democrats picked up seats. They gained uh a larger majority than the one they had already had as a result of the 32 election. And I think that's generally attributable to the success of the early New Deal. So we know, I think most of us, that we refer to Roosevelt's early legislative achievements as the first 100 days. If you look at the first 100 days, if you look at when recovery from the Great Depression started, it began right then with the institution of policies, that not only put people to work and supported agricultural commodity prices, but also induced a general expectation of inflation after four years of deflation. That cut people who had money spending their money because they knew it was going to be worth a little bit less uh, as time went on. So there is an immediate sparking of recovery then. And I think that bought Roosevelt a lot of goodwill and the ability to press forward with more reforms early in 34 and led to the victories in the elections of 34, which in turn then led to what we sometimes refer to as the second new deal, which is what gives you social security. That means old age pensions, disability insurance, unemployment insurance. It also led to the permanent public works program, the works progress administration and a more progressive tax structure and, and a more aggressive uh, sort of policy towards private monopolies. So the second new deal was building on the first new deal. And it was something that the Democrats could do because of their successes in the 1934 elections. How new were these kind of programs, uh, especially social safety net programs? I, I don't mean how new in the United States, even. I mean, just generally speaking, where it, was there any country that you that you at least know of that had any kind of tradition of something like this? Oh, yes. In fact, the United States is late to these things. Um, if you look back in uh, the late 19th century, uh, Denmark, uh, Germany, then Britain, various Western European countries, particularly Northwest European countries, had adopted these sort of social policies, often, if not always, at the behest of conservative politicians like uh, Bismarck or Churchill, who viewed them as ways to stave off revolution. Uh, so public housing, public health care, uh, old age pensions, uh, poor relief, work relief, all those kinds of things were um, turn of the century policies for Northwest European countries. And the United States was late to these. Americans had been, uh, various Americans had been proposing them since about the turn of the century, but there had been strong resistance to them from the American right uh, until the time of the Great Depression. What were the politics like for FDR to, to, to get these things through? I know the filibuster wasn't used necessarily in the 1930s the way it's used today, but did, did he need to grow his majority in, in, those, in the midterm election to be able to achieve such things as, say, like Social Security and, these, and, and stuff? Well, it certainly helped. It certainly was what they, what the New Dealers like Harry Hopkins, one of Roosevelt's principal aides, his relief minister, thought was necessary to do it. I mean, we often say, oh, yes, well, you know, Roosevelt had these massive majorities in Congress. And so, of course, he could do these things. You can't expect Biden to do the same with his 50 seat Senate majority and the general point is well taken. On the other hand, Roosevelt's majorities are kind of illusory. You know, those numbers hide the fact that the Democratic Party then was severely divided between its vastly more conservative Southern Jim Crow disfranchising wing and its Northern and Western urban multi-ethnic, multi-racial wing, which was the more progressive wing in terms of both then and now what we mean by progressive. So actually, Roosevelt needed the support of liberal Republicans, which were also a thing that existed then that doesn't really exist now, right? So, uh, you know, 
George Norris, particularly the Republican senator from Nebraska, is an important New Dealer. Or Fiera LaGuardia, the Republican mayor of New York City, was an important New Dealer. So just looking at the numbers of partisan majorities doesn't really tell you what the fight's going to be. Quite often, Southern Democrats lined up against New Deal policies. How, how close were the votes on, on a lot of these things? Were they, were they narrowly squeaking by or... Some things go sail through. I mean, if you, even if you look at the 100 days, which by in sort of popular discussion is Roosevelt's easiest moment, you know, the banking legislation sails through almost everybody votes for it. But by the time you get to the National Industrial Recovery Act, which has protections for uh, workers and first protects the right to organize really at the federal level, that's a very narrow vote, especially in the Senate. So I don't have the roll call off the top of my head, but it is a bit of a squeaker. This is Letters on Politics, and we are in conversation with Eric Rauschway, Distinguished Professor of History at the University of California, Davis, and author of the book, Why the New Deal Matters. Eric Rauschway, in your book, Why the New Deal Matters, you write that the New Deal didn't just save the economy, just didn't save people's livelihoods. It may very well have saved democracy. And, and those are yeah. my words. Those, I'm paraphrasing, yeah. Yeah, that's the general point of the book, though. You're right. Uh, you know, that, that I think that we have an unfortunate tendency and have had uh, during the last, you know, I don't know, 40 or so years during what we might, for the sake of argument, call the sort of neoliberal era, which is, I'm sure, a, a term that we, your, your listeners are familiar with, um, tended to think about the New Deal in terms of its sort of technical success. What did it do for the numbers? Where do we see GDP going? Where do we see unemployment going? Where do we see private investment going? What's the stock market doing? How does it compare to a properly Keynesian policy, et cetera? And that's fine uh, if that's the question you're interested in, but I think that's not the question you should be interested in, that from the point of view of 1933, the goal was not at all to go back to the way things had been. The goal was not at all to just recover back to the numbers being as high as they had been. The goal was to institute what Roosevelt and his allies referred to as social justice, to press for policies that were more equitable. Now, this is not to say that the Roosevelt administration would have met the requirements for social justice as we see it today, but he did see it as a progressive small p phenomenon, that you would move towards a more just and equitable society, and that's what the New Deal was meant to do. So Roosevelt himself said, I don't want to go back to the good old days. I have my doubts as to how good the good old days were. I want to move forward to new and better days. And that's the general thrust of the New Deal, is to restore Americans' faith in democracy, even while acknowledging that it was partial and flawed in many respects. Were there social forces pushing Roosevelt? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, Roosevelt was pressed by a variety of social forces, and those only increased in power, I think, as the 1930s went on. As uh, we've just discussed, one of the first pieces of New Deal legislation put the weight of the federal government on the side of unionization. And as unions formed, the Roosevelt administration was pressured by unions, particularly the CIO, which breaks away from the AFL in the middle of Roosevelt's presidency and becomes an important pressure from the left, not only on economic policies, but also on civil rights policies. Roosevelt, of course, was pressured by civil rights organizations uh, and uh, not including not only the NAACP and the Urban League, but unions like the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And Roosevelt generally encouraged pressure from the left, right? That this is uh, how he thought he was going to be helped in getting his policies through. There's a famous story, which I, I regret to say I believe is apocryphal, but it is true in essence, which is that Roosevelt is approached by one or another person. And this is one of the reasons I believe it's apocryphal, because you get different versions, his, who says, this is what you should do, Mr. President. This is the appropriate policy. It is just, it is equitable. And Roosevelt is supposed to have replied, all right, you've persuaded me. It's the right thing to do. Now make me do it. And as I say, whether that's actually true that he said that, he certainly operated like that. He encouraged people to pressure him from the left because it gave him room, right? He could say to other people, now, look, you've got to give me something. You've got to give me something because if you don't, we're going to fall into the hands of those people. And that's how Roosevelt got an awful lot of measures through that he might not otherwise have got through. 
where, where do we get that story then from about the <laughs> make me do it? Uh, I, I, you know, as I say, it's told with respect to A. Philip Randolph, the the uh, the leader of the uh, whether it's sleeping car reporters or the union leader, uh, Sidney Holman. So it's it's not 100 percent consistent as to who's. But I have seen evidence of Roosevelt behaving that way, even if he doesn't talk in so many words, say that way. You know, the go out there and, and make noise is the kinds of thing kind of thing that he says. Did the Communist Party USA play a role in this at all? I've um, heard that in the 30s, they were more of a significant force than, than you would see in modern times, post-Cold War era. Oh, certainly the Communist Party is a real and important thing, especially when you talk about unionization, and especially in California, um, as the work, I should say, of my colleague and wife, Catherine Olmsted, shows in uh, her book, Right Out of California, which is uh, about the role of communists in organizing uh, multiracial unions in California. And they were really the only ones who wanted to do it. Um, communists are also heavily involved in the San Francisco General Strike of 1934, these things are important because, again, they, they kind of give uh, new dealers a way to take a position that is seems more moderate than the far left, but is actually far to the left of where previous administrations have been. So in the case of the general strike, you know, you, you have the Hearst Papers headquartered in San Francisco calling for Roosevelt to, you know, sail into San Francisco Bay with all guns blazing and to put down the unions. And Roosevelt instead, of course, wants to point a mediating commission and <laughs> be, be very moderate. But this is a far cry from where previous Democratic presidents would have called out the army to put down the strikers. So. One of the chapters in your book, Why the New Deal Matters, is about Hunter's Point in in San Francisco. Um, is there any connection between that strike in, in 34 and, and what we'd eventually get in Hunter's Point? Um, I think that the, uh, you know, the connection is that when you stand at Hunter's Point now, which is where I start the beginning of that chapter, what you see is the way that the New Deal rebuilt the San Francisco peninsula and the Bay Area in general. And in fact, it's the New Deal that creates the Bay Area, you know, sort of physically, right, that gives you the bridges that span the Bay, that gives you the airports on the peninsula, and that, of course, gives you smaller scale infrastructure, including roads and schools and hospitals and, and so forth. And you can see that from standing on a hill like uh, uh, like the one at Hunter's Point. I think it's also um, and so, so so that's that's a response to you know pressure from unions and other groups who want there to be good jobs. And you can see, in fact, from Hunter's Point, you can see Coit Tower, where you can see the. Uh, Great New Deal era murals, which depict some of the left and union movements of, of the day. I, I think it's also significant, of course, in as much as Huntington Point is a predominantly black neighborhood today and was largely a black neighborhood then. And that shows some of the failings of the New Deal as well. And to sort of sum it up uh, a little bit um, over simply, but not 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 to not to do too much violence to the facts. When you had New Deal policies that were administered from Washington, when you had somebody like Harry Hopkins in charge of uh, hiring Americans for public works, then you had a policy against discrimination by race, which actually became a law against discrimination by race. And the WPA was very effective at giving Black Americans opportunities, uh, even for professional jobs, as the Urban League pointed out. And so it was a great success for Black. And it's the reason that Black voters shifted to the Democratic Party during Roosevelt's first term. Um, so when, you, when New Deal programs were run out of Washington, you could broadly say they were quite good for civil rights. And that includes the eventual creation of a civil rights section in the Department of Justice to enforce voting rights. However, when New Deal programs were farmed out to local or private agencies, uh, as they were in the South, so when the Southern Democratic Party ran a New Deal program, it would at least be segregated, if not actually you know, worse than that in terms of its civil rights policy. And... Um, as Hunter's point shows us, when they had uh, private real estate agents determine where New Deal agencies should back mortgage lending, you ended up with what now we now know as redlining, which is designating minority neighborhoods as unworthy uh, of receiving credit backed by the federal government, which has a legacy today. That we see in Hunter's point. 
in terms of, right, lower incomes, uh, in fact, worse environmental health because uh, there's worse pollution uh, in areas like that. So yes, that has a long-term legacy. And as even people who take up the slogan of the New Deal now, like Representative Ocasio-Cortez, would point out that in its failings, the New Deal also contributed to generational inequities. And was that failing just at the administration of the program at the local level? I, I always had the impression that to get some of these New Deal programs through Congress, they had to appease Southern Democrats that wanted segregation, Jim Crow policies baked into the New Deal. Um, they certainly had to get Democratic votes from the South on one or another occasion. And mostly that led to inequities like having a lower minimum wage for public works in the South than elsewhere. So you do have that kind of thing. It also contributes to some of the um, protections for unions being a bit weaker at first. It also contributes to um, having some of the uh, social safety net programs being less expansive than they otherwise would be. But I think it's most um, sort of flagrant uh, uh, effects lie in the failure to pass a national anti-lynching law, uh, which occurs repeatedly through the 1930s. And that's where the Senate filibuster does come into play, right, in the 1930s, where Southern senators are willing to filibuster an anti-lynching law. And Roosevelt is told, both implicitly and explicitly, on several occasions, that if he doesn't, you know, encourage his Democratic allies in Congress to lay off this kind of legislation, then he won't get his other New Deal laws, and then later that he won't get his war preparation laws. So the Southern Democrats are able to use their power in those cases to prevent Roosevelt from moving forward with certain forms of legislation. Like the anti-lynching law. Like the anti-lynching law, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez a moment ago. Of course, she is one of the proponents of a Green New Deal what, what, what do you think about something like the, the Green New Deal and how, how similar would it be to, say, the New Deal? Well, I mean, I think that there's a reason that Green New Dealers use that phrase. The reason is um, very clear. The original New Deal was a massive public works program that sought to address a crisis that was in part a crisis of environmental sustainability, as we would call it. Right? You will probably remember the Dust Bowl that characterized the Great Depression, that this was a result of ecological abuses. And the New Deal sought with new infrastructure, with new kinds of irrigation and uh, flood control and other forms of uh, sort of sustainable farm policies to address what we would understand as an ecological crisis. And programs like the TVA, which sought to make clean electricity from hydropower, um, were also ecologically conscious programs. Just defining the program scope in terms of the Tennessee River Valley, rather than in terms of a, some arbitrary political unit, like a county or a state or whatever, that was in part a ecological consciousness, right? So that's part of the original New Deal. And you can understand why Green New Dealers want to uh, channel that today. You can also understand that, of course, the New Deal was small d democratic, in its thrust. And if the New Deal is not the only program that successfully mobilized Americans for a peaceful purpose on this scale, it is certainly the largest program that did so, right? Normally, we mobilize lots of Americans by saying we're going to go kill other people. This is a case where you actually have a constructive form of patriotism with the New Deal. So that's why uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez, Senator Markey, and others I think find the New Deal appealing. You may have seen uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez's uh, posters uh, for the Green New Deal, which are deliberately channeling the WPA aesthetic and its democratic ideals. And I think that folks like that understand that if you could revive the spirit of the New Deal, this idea of pulling together in the common good to meet an ecological crisis for constructive purposes and for big public works and jobs, right? That all sounds very New Deal oriented. It does feel like the spirit of the New Deal has been resurrected 
Well, uh, certainly in the last few months, and especially if the president's jobs bill goes through uh, on anything like the scale and scope at which it has been proposed, um, then yes, that would be something that would be comparable to the New Deal in terms of its intention and scope. Uh, again, it's not for nothing that Representative Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Markey have proposed a civilian climate corps, which of course is deliberately uh, intending to evoke the civilian conservation corps of the early days of the New Deal. Tell me more about the environmental focus of the New Deal. Well, uh, one of the first programs that Roosevelt uh, got from the Congress was the Civilian Conservation Corps, which ended up hiring at any one time several hundred thousand uh, young Americans to go out into the woods and do construction in state parks for the purposes of fire or flood control or irrigation control or just general improvement. If you go to any state or federal park, uh, you're quite likely to see something built or improved by the CCC of the New Deal. And the CCC is also credited with creating a broader consciousness of conservation, of environmental stewardship for Americans. Uh, you should never forget that the arts programs of the New Deal are absolutely vital to delivering its message. When you see the iconography of the CCC or the WPA, you're getting the message, right, that this is a program that is all our responsibility. So the New Deal's CCC was a, a, what we would think of as an ecological program. Uh, as I say, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was charged with making the Tennessee River more uh, navigable, less prone to flooding, and also to generate hydroelectricity from the natural current in the Tennessee River, but also to prevent um, erosion in the Tennessee River Valley. And so to promote new kinds of farming, if you're familiar with terraced style plowing so as to prevent the promotion of soil erosion. That was something that TVA put forward to create fertilizer, to help restore nutrients in the soil, to stock wildlife uh, back in the region, right? There's a whole sort of environmental stewardship of thinking in the unit of the river valley as the important way of thinking about what the um, policies should be. Now it's worth pointing out that the TVA, while it was successful where it was, was just the TVA. There were proposals to have other River Valley authorities that were never implemented. And this is one of the stories of the New Deal is that it is remained incomplete in the 1930s and remains incomplete today, that uh, in large measure because the war took over yeah. and altered people's priorities. So, for example, the TVA, which began as a hydroelectric system, was authorized to burn coal during the war so that you could have enough electricity to produce planes, which, of course, made it a polluting agency and no longer an agency uh, worthy of its original charter. Right. Was there a recognition of that at the time or did they just not know enough? Um, Concerning the pollution, part, like, like, was there an idea of getting beyond that down the road? I think that uh, throughout both the Depression and the war, there was always a crisis, if not an emergency mindset, that you needed to get past the immediate crisis, then you would worry about other priorities later. So again, you know, Roosevelt was always going to sacrifice certain kinds of social justice measures, including African-American civil rights, first to the New Deal, then to the war, or Japanese American civil rights to the larger game or the rights of refugees, largely Jewish from Europe, to the aim of gaining support for the war. Roosevelt was brutal, pragmatic, racist, whatever you want to say about sacrificing those uh, aims to what he understood as the larger emergency goal. You know, as Robert Weaver, who was a black economist who worked for the New Deal, uh, who later became the first African-American cabinet secretary uh, in U.S. history, uh, said, you know, I believe Roosevelt was a great president, but he was not a great civil rights president. That, you know, he always thought that the New Deal first and then the war took priority. Fulfilling the New Deal, would that have been the second Bill of Rights that Roosevelt brought up shortly before his death? Yes, I think that's a good way to look at it. I think that if you look at Roosevelt's wartime speeches, you can see that he thought of the war as a war to make the world more of a New Deal type world. So when you think about the four freedoms, 
uh, for which the United States was mobilizing even before the war in early 1941. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear. This is a sort of a New Deal idea. And he used those war aims to secure the cooperation of the Allies in post-war conferences that were intended to create a world like that, to lay the foundation for what after his death became the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, over which Eleanor Roosevelt presided in 1948. And as you say, the second Bill of Rights speech of 1944, which envisioned pressing forward with a broader social safety net, the rights to education, the rights to health care, and broader forms of economic human rights. Roosevelt definitely thought of those things as the next logical steps after an Allied victory in the war. Eric Roshway is our guest. Eric Roshway is Distinguished Professor of History at the University of California, Davis, and he is the author of the book, Why the New Deal Matters. Uh, you you start off early uh, after the introduction of your book with Arlington Cemetery. Does this cemetery, one of the ultimate symbols of, of I, I guess, of military and patriotism, come from the New Deal? Uh, I want I, uh, each chapter starts in a particular location to try to work into the New Deal or a part of the New Deal from a particular location, and partly that's because I want to show how ubiquitous. The history of the New Deal remains with us today. In the case of Arlington National Cemetery, I wanted to start with two particular graves, the graves of the two men who were killed by police uh, during the Bonus March of 1932. And I think that's a very important moment to look at at the beginning of the New Deal, or even before the beginning of the New Deal, because it's a very plastic moment. You have thousands, possibly as many as tens of thousands of veterans of the Great War coming to Washington, D.C., beginning on the West Coast, hitching rides and hopping freights and joining with their fellows all across the country to descend on Washington to camp, first with the help of the Washington City Police, who are headed by a sympathetic veteran of the war, to organize an encampment to lobby Congress for the payment of what's known as the bonus. This is, of course, before the GI Bill of Rights. So, at that time, veterans of the Great War were promised a lump sum payment in recognition of their service, which would be due in 1945. They decided in the Great Depression to come and lobby for the earlier payment of it for obvious reasons. Many of them were unemployed and suffering, and um, that's why they were there. So they were lobbying for payment of the bonus early. Congress told them no. President Hoover told them no, that even if Congress passed it, he would veto it. But they remained. And they continued to demonstrate, they continued to march. Their encampment became ever more permanent with uh, institutions, including a newspaper, which we can still find and read in libraries. And as I say, it shows how plastic this moment is. It shows how the bonus marchers could have gone in a very fascist direction, right? That the leader of the bonus march thought of himself as being akin to Mussolini or Hitler. He saw the bonus march movement as becoming a kind of khaki shirt movement akin to the brown shirts or the black shirts, and that maybe they would have to move in that direction if their democratically elected representatives wouldn't do what they needed. Right? So Hoover's response to that was to mobilize the powers of the federal government, not to give people jobs or to save the banks, but to send the army to drive off the marchers, which they did with uh, tear gas and uh, tanks, and cavalry. Um, it, before the army went out, the police went out. That's when those two men were shot. So that's why we begin with their deaths. When the army came out, they managed not to kill anybody except a baby who probably died as a result of the tear gassing, which uh, allowed General MacArthur to be regarded as a great victory. Roosevelt looked at this during the presidential campaign and saw in it the two potential routes to fascism or a populist dictatorship or whatever you want to call it, right? On the one hand, you might have this sort of bottom-up groundswell, which could lead to somebody like the Bonus Marchers leader becoming a dictator or somebody like Huey Long with popular support becoming a dictator. Or Roosevelt saw conversely, somebody like Douglas MacArthur could, with the backing of the establishment, become a dictator because he would keep the mob at bay. But either way, Roosevelt saw in it the dangers of democratic collapse, which is why when he 
came into office and instituted the Civilian Conservation Corps, one of the first things he did was extend those jobs to veterans of the Great War, uh, many of whom took him up on the offer. And in fact, the leader of the Bonus March, who had previously thought of himself as a Mussolini type, uh, refused to come back when a bunch of the marchers wanted to come back to Washington, saying that, well, now the New Deal is going to do what we needed done in the first place. That's fascinating and interesting and important to remember that both Mussolini and Hitler rode to power on the backs of World War I veterans. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's certainly how the bonus marchers saw their power as being akin to those movements. There were movements in other countries which didn't necessarily succeed, but certainly threatened to do so. As in France, there was the Croix de Feu, which is also a right-wing movement of veterans. And that was a, quite a commonplace phenomenon in the world, that the war had left this legacy of veterans who might support an, an overthrow of existing institutions. The opposition to the New Deal, is this something that we don't see until after the Roosevelt presidency? Is, is it mostly muted during the presidency? Um, I mean, because you know, we have a multi-decade effort going all the way up till recent days of trying to undo the New Deal. But, but were things just so desperate during the Great Depression and then the magnitude of World War II that that opposition was somewhat muted? Or, or was there the kind of opposition that you would you would you would relate to later on i think if you listen to the right people you will hear opposition to the new deal in 1932 and afterwards that sounds very similar to what you would hear today so for example if you look at the terms on which president hoover uh, opposed the construction of public dams to generate electricity the idea that it would undermine American initiative and destroy American traditions. If you look at the language in which President Hoover opposed the New Deal generally, which he said would crack the timbers of the Constitution uh, and would set us on the road to Moscow, then you can, you know, that, all that stuff sounds pretty familiar, I think. And uh, Hoover is one of the earliest articulators of conservative, what we would understand of as conservative anti-New Deal um, thinking. And he continues to articulate it quite effectively through the Roosevelt presidency. In, in, in 1934, Hoover published a book called The Challenge to Liberty, which uh, Barry Goldwater would later say is the book that uh, crystallized his thinking. Uh, so you can draw a straight line from Hoover to Goldwater, from of course Goldwater to Reagan. There's a strong California Western tradition there uh, that gives you um, anti-New Deal opposition. And it's a line that goes right down to the present day. Now, as you say, of course, in the 30s and 40s, that's not a majority position. But it is a, is a position, and it is a very considerable position, and it's abetted by the fact that uh, press uh, uh, executives or, or media barons or whatever we would call them today, right, people like William Randolph Hearst or Robert McCormick, uh, loathe the New Deal as a program and Roosevelt as a person with every fiber of their being. So in print, on the airwaves, in newsreels, you see an awful lot of anti-New Deal sentiment. Really interesting to think about the role that Hoover played after his presidency, rather than in, until recent times, we anticipate a president kind of being quiet, not oppositional to the next president. Of course, that's it's not the case that we're living with now, and that wasn't the case that FDR lived with. No, Hoover was, uh, Hoover was very anti-New Deal. Um, he was a bit less blunt than his uh, contemporary counterpart, as you say, uh, but then almost everybody is. But Hoover, you know, very early on kind of figured out what would become the standard Republican template for being anti-New Deal for some decades, which is you don't go directly against the New Deal or any specific New Deal policy because, in fact, they're popular. So what you do is you talk in sort of quasi-religious terms about as, wrote, as Hoover said, the challenge to liberty that is out there being posed by forces unnamed, right? That liberty is good, that we don't want it challenged, but he doesn't say that, and therefore you shouldn't vote for Roosevelt, right? He just sort of articulates these sort of vague principles. It's worth pointing out that Hoover privately referred to the challenge to liberty, that book, as the Ark of the Covenant, right? He thought about it again as a way of crystallizing Republican sort of religious principles, rather than specifically taking on economic policies where he thought he would lose. Hi. Do you think op uh, opponents to the New Deal with time would turn the American public against 
the New Deal. I mean, th- there are obviously some third rails that you're not supposed to touch. Medicare and Social Security. Uh, Social Security coming from the New Deal. Medicare would come with Lyndon Johnson much later. Um, I mean, I guess Lyndon Johnson was trying to sort of renew the spirit of, of, of the New Deal in the late 60s. Oh, yeah. Johnson, you know, who first came into office in Roosevelt's second term in a special election, uh, often referred to Franklin Roosevelt as his daddy, and thought of himself as, uh, you know, trying to do better than daddy, you know, in terms of his uh, domestic legislation. There was a definite Oedipal thing going on there. But, um, I mean, I think it's true that after Johnson's presidency sort of went uh, up in smoke owing to his ill-advised foreign policy, um, I think it was possible to turn a large number of Americans against the New Deal. You just didn't say we are anti-New Deal. You say we are opposed to big government, right? So you have people like Jimmy Carter within the Democratic Party saying that we no longer want to be looking to Washington for solutions. And that's, you know, the route that he takes to the presidency. And of course, he's being pressed from the right by the then governor of California or the then former governor of California, Ronald Reagan, right, who is trying to push the Republican Party in a gold, more Goldwater-esque direction, and he succeeds. And uh, I think that most folks uh, credit Reagan with, again, being able to articulate an anti-New Deal position without expressly saying, I hate the New Deal. Yeah. Last week, on Friday, we got a new jobs report that has been characterized as being disappointing because it didn't create the million jobs that were anticipated, only about a quarter of that. You know, in normal times, $260,000 jobs create 260,000 jobs created we would be, you know, a solid report, but not when you're expecting a, a million. Uh, one of the critiques towards it has been the additional payments for unemployment. People don't aren't aren't rushing out uh, to find the first job. Uh, that they can get. And we already see some states with Republican uh, governors uh, taking away that additional $300 per check that the federal government provided with the American Recovery Act. Um, it, it did make me think, and you know, maybe we're, no two parallels are exactly alike, but it did make me think, was it in 1936? I'm not the scholar, you'll, you'll, you'll correct all this, where Roosevelt turned his attention to try to balance the budget, an issue he actually campaigned on uh, in 1932, and that that led to what they'd call a double dip depression? I mean, you're right that in 37, Roosevelt uh, tried to balance the budget, and that um, was by consensus, we would now say in retrospect, too soon to pull back on the emergency hiring programs of the New Deal and did create a recession. Uh, Insofar as it's true, and I, I want to say that as a kind of, uh, I want to put that down as a marker because I don't know how true it is that the unemployment and better fence are the thing that are stopping people from getting a job. But insofar as it's true, if it were true, um, that would be a very New Deal kind of thing to do, right? That Roosevelt and other New Dealers sought to push wages up by having federal wages be higher. If federal wages were higher, if working conditions on federal jobs were better and people preferred those federal jobs, that would force private employers to offer more money and better conditions on their jobs. Roosevelt understood New Deal policy as serving that kind of indirect effect. So if it's true, and again, I say if, because I don't know that it's true, but if it's true that people prefer drawing a check from the federal government to drawing a private check, then private employers need to raise their wages, is what Franklin Roosevelt would have told them. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I, I didn't see people rushing back into low paying you know, jobs as necessarily a bad thing. Um, and it, it, when, when you laid that out, it also made me think about something you said at the beginning of our conversation about inflation, because obviously that would cause inflation, which is something we usually worry about. But you, you put it in a very different way, knowing and seeing that inflation was coming caused people to then start spending their money, realizing it wasn't going to be uh, the same value down the road. Hence, that would also in and of itself spur the economy forward. <laughs> 
Right. Well, you and I are not, as you kindly pointed out, are not old enough to remember a period of severe deflation, right? But that's what you had in the late 20s and the early 30s. So it was vital to reverse that expectation. I mean, again, we have never lived through this, but if you expect prices to continue falling, that's a capitalism killer because then you have no motive whatsoever to make any purchase other than the absolutely necessary ones. You can defer optional purpose purchases indefinitely because you know your money will be worth more tomorrow than it is today. Deflation is death to capitalism, right? Whereas a moderate level of inflation is really sort of capitalism's lifeblood. You know, you want people's money to be slightly singeing a hole in their pocket, if not actually burning a hole in their pocket. So people say, well, I really ought to buy that X, Y, or Z that I don't really need because Otherwise, it'll be more expensive tomorrow or the week after. So that's why a moderate level of inflation is healthy. Obviously, you don't want hyperinflation, but a low level of inflation, which is what the Fed targets these days, right, is healthy for a consumer economy. So that's that was Roosevelt's thinking, uh, certainly in, in 1933 and afterward. And retrospectively is what a lot of economists attribute the economic success of the New Deal to, is inducing the expectation that prices would begin to rise again. Eric Rauschway, distinguished professor of history at the University of California, Davis. He has joined us for a conversation about the New Deal and about his new book called Why the New Deal Matters. Eric Rauschway, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Thanks very much, Mitch. I appreciate it.